this afternoon's health topic is about modern animal farming. This is a short topic. And before I go to the main topic, I would just like to know, uh, let you know that in the coming years, it is projected that about one out of every three women and one out of every five men will have osteoporosis. That's the projected in the coming decades. And we have always been taught of the same lessons. If we ask anybody, how, how do you prevent osteoporosis? They have, usually they have the same answers. If I would ask you this afternoon, how would, what's, what's the element, what's uh, in the food that we eat that we should take to prevent osteoporosis? Do you know? They always said it's calcium. But calcium is just one piece of the puzzle. If you've noticed, I've placed here a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And at the end of the lecture, we will know the rest of the pieces. And if you ask the question, what is the best source of calcium, we tend to answer the same way. If I would ask you today, what is the best source of calcium? Do you know? I can't hear you. Okay, that's the most common answer, it's the milk. But do you know, I've, I've mentioned this study yesterday, and if some of you have been paying uh, attention, I've said it's 120,000 participants. Well, the, this Harvard nurses study has a lot of subsets. It depends on what they're focusing on. For this particular subset, they had only 77,000, but that's a lot. That's a big study. And it's a 12-year-long study. The, the whole Harvard nurses study probably was 30 years. But for this subset, they had 12 years of study. And they found out that those who consumed more calcium from dairy food broke more bones. Uh, how did that happen? That they, those who had more calcium broke more bones. Now, the Harvard said calcium is important. But milk isn't the only or even the best source. Now you say, hey, it's just Harvard saying, just, yeah, it's a big institution, but just one. Actually, the largest holder of the database for cancer has the same conclusions. It's the World Cancer Research Fund International. That's the largest that we have today when it comes to cancer database and they would have they, they say it's not the best source because they found out that milk can actually increase your risk for cancers and so if smoking is too long cancer milk is to prostate cancer that's one of the strongest links they have today we go to groceries and we tend to see these boxes a milk, and then you see there a happy cow, uh, really happy to share their, their milk with uh, everybody. And sometimes we also see these pictures about the cows that give us milk. Do, do, do you think this is the real condition? Do you think this is how happy the cows are in the farms? Maybe many years ago, probably, but today... This is how they look like. They're like parts of machines in the factories that are right there. They can't move. Their, their sole purpose in their life is to just to provide everybody the dairy and the milk that they like. So that's the reality. This is, you don't see this in your milk boxes. They won't dare show you this. And not only are these cows not allowed to move around, to enjoy walking around, they're given antibiotics to help them survive. And not only that, they are also given growth hormones to increase their milk supply. Now, because naturally, cows won't produce milk all their lives. They're just, just the time... When, they, when they've given birth to another one, that they, they produce milk. 
But this food industry will not be contented with that amount of milk that they're producing. They have to produce more because if they produce more, they get more money. And so they have to give them growth factors so that they would continuously produce their milk. Unfortunately, some of recent findings found that when these cows are given these growth hormones, these growth hormones crosses their milk, it gets into our products, and in the humans, it causes a lot of cancers, the prostate cancer being the strongest. Here's a statement from the World Cancer Research Fund. So because the World Cancer Research Fund will just not accept data about, <clears throat> let's say they, they see when you increase your milk intake, they see an increase in prostate cancer. They will not just accept that. They have to find a mechanism. If there, is, if there are statistics and there is no mechanism, they, don't, they won't accept that. But because they've found the mechanism, they say, Yes, probably this is the explanation why there is prostate cancer. They found that your, the milk consumption of milk from these cows increases this growth factor, which increases the cancer in humans. Now, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, explain this one to you because uh, this is a bit more complicated. But that is what uh, the, the experts are now telling us. Well, the good news is you have better options, like you can have soy milk, you can have broccoli, you can have okra. I was surprised that it had 180 milligrams of calcium per cup, and actually milk has around 200 or 230 for those that are really high, and it's not, it's very close, 180 and 200. Malungay. You love malungay? It's a, it has a lot of calcium. Oranges are also sources of calcium. So you have a lot of better options for your calcium. Now, the, the, the true secret they found to stronger bones is not just calcium. It's calcium, vitamin D. You get that from exposure to the sun. We have learned that um, nights ago. Surprisingly, there's a, a new research found that not, it's not just vitamin D, it's also vitamin K, uh, although it's for, uh, to a lesser extent. And stress, not the kind of stress that you're, you might be thinking. But, uh, putting weight or stress exercise to your bones will strengthen them. So that's probably, for today, the complete picture of having stronger bones. It's not cow's milk. Now, there's something more that we have to know this afternoon. A, a author of, the author of the Food Inc. said, the industry doesn't want you to know the truth about what you're eating because if you knew, you might not want to eat it. Why? Do you know that in the United States, 80% of their antibiotics goes to, not humans, it's go, it goes to the factory animals. In the Philippines, we do not, uh, unfortunately, we do not have the numbers, but I'll show you that we are doing the same here. Why, why, why do they give these antibiotics to their animals? Because the, the energy of these animals, they have to use it for growth. They use it for uh, going around, for movement, and they use it for their defense. Now, the food industry does not want them to use all their energy Walking around, jumping around, they don't want them to get sick. They just want them to grow so that they, they, they be ready for harvest sooner. So they took care of this problem for them. They placed them in these cages so that they don't, they don't move around. And they took care of the defense. They just gave all these animals the antibiotics that they need so that they don't have to worry about infections so that all they could do is just build, build, and build, and grow. So that uh, many years ago, this is the size of a chicken at 70 days. In 2008, at 48 days, this is how big a ch chickens are. But in the Philippines, the, one of the largest chicken producers in the Philippines, I'm not going to name them, they're very proud to say in 32 days, they can reach the same. 32 days. And they're very proud of it. They, 
here's their tagline. They grow fast, say faster than your next haircut. Okay, so no doubt we are doing the same here in the Philippines. I will not name the company, but chances are if you're eating chicken, you're getting it from them because they're just one of the best, finest in the country. Here's a picture from them. Actual picture from them, you can see the chickens. But I would like you to focus on this particular uh, uh, part of the picture. Can you read? It says, Neo Meditril. That's what they're giving the chickens. Now, this one is an antibiotic. This is not used for humans, it's for animals. But the equivalent of this for humans is ciprofloxacin. For the medical students and those in the medical world, they know this. I would like you to remember this. Just this too. Because later, I will, you will see this again. So anyway, they are actually given, giving their chickens antibiotics so that they could grow faster. So uh, somebody from inside said, uh, he has a testimony. He said he tried being a contract grower for the blank for a year, and he is duty-bound for their feeding schedules and medications, and he said they were feeding the birds with this antibiotics from day one. So, yeah, they're very small. They're giving antibiotics already. He said the antibiotic doses increases progressively, and they are given, even if they're not sick, they just give it to them. Everybody takes their dose. And he, he understands that the, these antibiotics are being banned in other countries, but we are doing it here in the Philippines. It's banned in the other countries because they found that it causes a lot of diseases in humans. And a couple years ago, the Philippine Journal of Veterinary Medicine found that around 64% of the chickens in the market has a lot of bunch of antibiotics. They didn't publish a newer study, probably they didn't make it, but yeah, this is the data uh, 2008, and that's a lot. That's 64%, that's more than half of the chickens have loads of antibiotics when they are already ready to be sold, dressed and ready to be sold. So what happens if you eat chickens or eggs or, beefs that are, or beef that have these antibiotics? Now, I have a story. Uh, meet John the Brave. John the Brave is a bacteria. He, 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 he works in the army. He fights in the front line, and one day there was this uh, new antibiotic. It was so strong that John feared for his life. And so uh, during the battle, he, he took a paper and he started writing. He started writing to Jane. He said, Dear Jane, uh, the, the battle is fierce. We have a new enemy. It's, it's new. We have not yet met this enemy before. And just in case I don't make, make it, I would just like you to know that I would like you to read the rest of the paper. He, he wrote all the information about the new enemy. And in, in the short run, uh, John didn't make it. John the Brave died. So the letter was sent home, sent home to Jane. Jane the Avenger. So Jane started reading the letter, and maybe she cried because John died. But then Jane has this letter from John which contains all the information that she can use so that she could defeat the enemy, the antibiotic, the next time she she meets uh, or she sees uh, the antibiotic. So Jane studied the papers. It was a lot of pages to read, but she was determined to avenge John's death. And because the letter, at the back of the letter, it says, be the best version of yourself today and every day after that. Yeah, there were bacteria trying to talk to each other. And Jane is now a better version of that bacteria because she now knows how to combat the new antibiotic. Now, uh, enough of the story. That's how superbugs came, uh, come around. This, uh, this part, uh, bacteria will uh, gain information about how to defeat the new antibiotic. It passes them to the other bacteria. And so before you know it, you have a lot of uh, uh, microbes that are resistant to your 
antibiotics. History tells us that many years ago, it takes around 10, 11 years before an antibiotic gets resistance. Let's say, you see here, erythromycin, 1953, then you get resistance a couple years, 10 or more years later. But today, we're having resistance at the same year they're being released. 1996, you get the same, same, same year you get resistance. And ceftarolin is actually a fifth generation, and it's just one year after it was released that there is resistance. The microbes are just gaining speed in knowing how to defeat the antibiotics that we are creating. This, this uh, information is from the CDC. And so today, they say there's a problem. Number one, doctors are being irresponsible. That's something that only us doctors have to correct because most of you cannot do something about it. But number two, they found out that the antibiotics in food animals is being a problem. They say these are commonly used in food animals to prevent, control, and treat disease and to promote the growth of food-producing animals, according to the CDC. Last year, the World Health Organization made a meeting because it was such a great problem. They said this, this was their first meeting. The first global report on antibiotic resistance reveals serious worldwide threat to public health. They said... We are, go we are ushering to an era, a post-antibiotic era, in which common infections and minor injuries, which have been treatable in the past, can now, uh, uh, can once again kill. Essentially, they are saying we are near the, the era wherein our antibiotics might not work anymore. It's serious. They just, it's the first meeting they had last year because they see that the rise of uh, resistant microbes are very fast. And they have a lot of findings, but I would like you to focus on this. They found that resistance to fluoroquinolones is very widespread. Did you remember this slide? You see, this is something that is banned in other countries, but we are doing here in the Philippines. They're feeding this antibiotic to these chickens, and now we have a lot of resistance. So it is a serious threat. Now, why did I tell you all of this uh, this afternoon? Because I believe that better informed people make better decisions. And, and so I hope that as you continue to attend our health lectures for the rest of the seminar, you will be better informed of what's in your food and so that you can make better choices in the coming days. Mm -hmm.